Please join me in welcoming Assembly Member Shirley Wofford. Thank you, and good evening. If I had known that, I would have brought my grandkids too. You know, we could have a real show out. Um, first of all, I want to congratulate those of you who are graduating. Uh, I'm always impressed when folks take it upon themselves to engage in a program that's going to improve not only them, but hopefully enhance the life of the people in the community. It's very, very important. You know, community work and community work is, is, is important work. And we sometimes think it's not. Some people think it's just folks just jumping up and doing something and, and then they do sometimes good and sometimes they do a lot of damage, oftentimes because of they, ha they haven't had the kind of training and development that needs to be there. And I'm just excited that we're now at a point in our development where we really see the value of that. And we are actually dealing with individuals in training I spoke at a graduation, I think it was last week, of the San Diego Leadership Group. Uh, their graduation and their graduating cohorts and, and, and individuals who are learning about leadership, learning about engagement and community involvement. And this is so very, very important. Um, important work because obviously we're in a very critical time in our communities where we are looking at resources and things that ought to happen and looking at other communities and how we should be developing and those things that we need, and feeling sometimes very frustrated that we're not accomplishing the things that we want to accomplish and how we do that. I've been asked to talk very briefly, like eight to 10 minutes, they told me, which is wonderful, um, <clears throat> to just share with you um, my passion and my interest in your interest in serving. Uh, I was asked to talk about when, was, when did I get involved, and I can't even remember when I got involved. Uh, because I think I've had a life of service all of my life. Uh, as I always say, I was an educator. I started teaching when I was five years old on my mother's back porch when I got a chalkboard and some chalk. And when I say that, I have to remind young people what chalk is. But anyway, uh, when I got a chalkboard and some chalk and, and basically did everybody's homework in the neighborhood, I didn't know I was supposed to do that. But, um, but I began then working with individuals and learning and seeing how excited it was to watch people improve themselves, to learn to be able to do their homework, to be able to do the kinds of things that were assigned. And so as far back as I can remember, I've been engaged. My mother was not one who joined a lot of things, but she did a lot of community work, so that she was always a woman collecting money in the neighborhood. Anyone, sometimes, so anytime someone died or became sick or needed food or whatever, she was always the one who found out about it and went door to door, knocking on doors to do those things. And she was a volunteer with the polls, and so we had a voting poll and I, in my living room in my house in South Central LA. So the concept of service has always been a part of my life a strong belief that things only happen when you make them happen. That you can sit around and, and complain about what's not going to happen, and yet as a person, you need to take the responsibility. I think at 15 years old, I, had, I went to a huge church, and we organized our first food, our dinner at Thanksgiving for the homeless at my church. And I was chair of the committee. And we, and we got all kinds of donations and food, and we spent our Thanksgiving serving the homeless in our community. And so the concept of being of service, of not complaining, but working to make it happen, became a part of my life early on. And it's continued to this day that I don't just sit around waiting for things to happen, but firmly believe that I can make it happen. And also believe a sense of responsibility that if things don't happen, it's because I didn't do enough. And, that, and, that's, and that's an awesome responsibility. You know, when I look at situations, particularly most of you know my passion is education, K-12 education. And um, when things don't happen for kids, the first thing I ask is, what didn't I do right? Why wasn't I there? Why didn't I raise that issue? Did I, or if some kids get hurt, I said, did I ever meet that child? Did I ever say anything to them that was encouraging? So I take personal responsibility for the life of everyone in San Diego, personal responsibility for the educational system that is failing our children. And that's why when people say, you have such passion, because I feel that all of us have to have passion about what we believe. And we have to have the idea that we can make the difference. Because if you don't have that idea, then you feel frustrated because you don't put enough into it, 
or you don't really understand the power of the individual to make things happen and the passion and the drive that's so essential. It is really, really important that we have people of color and, and poor people on commissions in the city and, and committees. That is critical, not just physically present, but their viewpoint and their voice. I've been on so many committees where there are people who look like me who never say a word, who never tell me, uh, who never support an issue, who don't fight for things, who know that things are going wrong and never raise the issue. And then, of course, when I get out of the meeting, they whisper to me on the fourth and the fifth quarter, you know, I really believe in that. And I put my hand up and said, I don't want to hear that. Those people in there need to hear that. But we need people who are going to have the voice, who are going to have the courage to stand up. And I can tell you that is not an easy thing to do. But the first time you do it, it's hard. The second time, it's easier. And the third time, they start expecting it. And the fourth time, when you don't do it, they want to know what's wrong with you. So it's not an easy task to do. But when you do it and you stake out your space in life, everyone expects it. They expect me to get up in the assembly and fight for kids. They expect me to fight for education. They expect me to fight for uh, accountability for teachers. They expect that of me. They expect me to stand up for justice, for equality. They expect me to stand up for the homeless. They expect me to stand up for uh, farm workers and fair pay wages. They expect that for me to do anything else would be out of character. And so it becomes important that you kind of stake out who you are so that people are not confused about your position. And it becomes easier because you're consistent in your advocacy for those who need advocacy. And, and as I said, it is so important to not just physically be there. I've been in too many committees where the, the balance is correct, the number of women, the number of men, the number of people of color, and the decisions turn out to be the same as they were before the diversity occurred. I can remember being on the committee and looking when I was on the school board, and I think it was Prop 209 came out. And our school board voted unanimously to oppose Prop 209. And I looked at our city council that had six people that were women and people of color out of the eight that were on city council. And they could not pass a resolution in favor of Prop 209. I said, what was the point of you people being there? What was the point of us voting for all these women? What was the point of us voting for people of color? What was the point of us basically creating this diverse city council if it was not going to take the stands that were necessary in this city to represent the diversity of the city. And so it becomes important that we just not look at folks in terms of making sure the numbers and the colors are right, but that the positions are correct, and the advocacy is correct, and the willingness to stand is correct. And so I really want to encourage you as you talk about being an advocate, being on committees and commissions, that you recognize that that role is critical it is a role of advocacy. It's a role of fighting on behalf of people who need you to fight for them. And you know, when I served on the school board, I was one out of five on the school board, the only person of color on the school board. And it was an awesome task, because the people were bad people, they just didn't have my experience. And so I was forever educating and teaching them about what it felt like to be a person of color in this city, to be a woman in this city, who had certain positions and had to educate them consistently about why they couldn't do certain things in this city to children of color. And it was initially a difficult task, but it became easier because they recognized the fact that what I was saying really represented, even though I was one out of five, I represented almost 60% of the student population in the city at that time. That I was carrying the voice for Latinos and Asians and African Americans and everyone else who had felt disenfranchised in the school system. And so it became important that I didn't give up my voice, that I accelerated my voice in terms of making sure that people heard me and they understood why I was there fighting for these children, why I was fighting for the programs and the issues that are so critical. So I want to encourage you to think about it, that when you think about being on a board and commission, it's not about the enhancement of one's resume. You know, it's not about the enhancement of one's resume. It's really about the enhancement of the voice of our community in places where they need to be. And that we face right now a very critical time, very serious time in terms of what is happening with police in our city, what's happening with people of color in our city. Those are, these are some critical times. 
And I can tell you, having fought for racial profiling bill AB 953 in the assembly, and I thank PICO and all those community groups that were there fighting with me on the ground, I mean, really fighting hard, that when I look at that, and that, and that battle was so hard, not because there weren't people of color who could vote for it, but because those folks didn't oftentimes feel they had to represent the communities in which they lived. But I was fighting against people who looked like me. I was fighting against women. I was fighting against Latinos. I was fighting against people who had been racially profiled themselves out of fear of what may happen to them. And so this battle was even more difficult because I was fighting people who should have easily understood, who had been racially profiled themselves, and who should have been fighting. And I'm sure their communities thought they were fighting for this bill because oftentimes those things are not easily understood. And so I want to make sure that you understand just how important it is. You're going to be involved in really the decision making of the city. A lot of work is done when you serve these committees. And when you get on there, the first thing you do is you understand what the committee or commission is all about. What are the power, where is the power in that commission? If it's advisory, then, then find out who you're giving advice to and become their friend. Get to know them. Get to know them and, and so that you can influence them with the advice that you give. Make sure you understand parliamentary procedure. Because if you don't, they'll run a game on you every time. And you'll be sitting there trying to figure, do we vote, do we not, do we do, do we don't? And no, you need to know parliamentary procedure so that you can be an advocate and a strong force on that commission and that board that's there. And then you need to find that commission that is your passion and your drive. Because if it's tied to you and it's your passion, it will be something that you will always want to do and fight for. So let me just simply say in closing that, you know, I congratulate you on what you're doing. You're beginning some great work. Some of you have already done it because I've met so many at the door who've already been involved and engaged and this is just going to give you another tool in your belt to continue this battle. But we need you, I need you to be a voice, to be that person who's going to be an advocate. We need folks who understand the city, who understand the county, who understand the state, who are writing letters, who are attending commissions, who are making statements, who are advocating for us. We need you, because I can tell you on the other side, they are organized, they are prepared, and they're there every day at the Capitol, they're there every day at, at City Hall when I was on the Citizen Equal Opportunity Commission, you know, the, the, the building industry was there every day to advocate against equity and equal opportunity and access. They're there every day in the county. And so they are there, and which sometimes we paid individuals to lobby against the communities in which we serve. And so we need your voice. We need your presence. We need you to be there. We need you to be at the school board. We need to be everywhere. I was telling a group the other day at the NAACP when we were talking about um, a gentleman was asking me yesterday morning, he was saying, well, what, are, what, you know, what, what about all these, these folks and we need a voice and we need this and we need that? I said, you know what? Right now, as we always have had, as a community, we must stay organized all the time. We cannot get organized when there's a crisis because it's too late. We have to stay organized. We have to be focused because there are issues every day that affect our lives. There are issues that impact us every day, everything we do. And we have to stay organized and prepared so that when I've got something coming up, I should be able to quickly call as I do PICO. And they're organized statewide. And they're there. And they're fighting. And they're going in inside of those offices to make a difference. We need to stay organized because the battle is real. And the consequences of what we may win or lose are too great. And so we can't afford to just drop it and walk away because it not only affects our life, but it affects the future of our children and our children's children. So let me say it as I close that this is a, a, a good battle, a good fight. We're fighting for the dignity of this community. We're fighting for the opportunity of our children. We're fighting for justice and equality. We're fighting for, uh, for those things that are good and pure. And I tell them in Sacramento, I have a statement that I always say that hatred and indifference and ugliness is always present. But when we think about it, I think about it in terms of flowers. I always say that of justice and equality and inclusion are rare flowers that have to be tended to and nurtured and watered every day. But ugliness and hatred is a weed and it grows best in neglect. Thank you so very much for having me.